The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. I'm Beth Sowen. I'm co-director of Climate Interactive. Um, and we're really thrilled to have you at our webinar about multi-solving for climate and health. Um, we're going to get started in a minute or two. It looks like people are still joining. I'm um, joined here by a few of my colleagues, um, and they're sort of standing by to help with technical problems. So if anyone's having any trouble, use the chat box um, in the GoToMeeting control panel, and we can try to help you out with any problems that you're having. All right, um, I think we'll get started. Again, my name is Beth Sawin. I'm the co-director of Climate Interactive. I'm here with several of my colleagues, almost everyone who worked on the report actually, except our colleague Maria Jose Gutierrez in Costa Rica, who's not here, but will be on future webinars. Um, so in a few minutes, the rest of the team will have a chance to introduce themselves. Uh, what we're gonna do this morning, uh, this is the first of our webinars about our new report on multi-solving for health and climate. Um, this will be sort of a general overview about the report and we'll talk in detail about a couple of the 10 case studies. Then throughout the year, we're gonna have um, webinars that focus more in detail on a couple of the case studies at a time. And we'll tell you more about that during the webinar today. Um, you also can really help us by both using the chat and the um, a couple poll questions that we're gonna ask you during the webinar. It's a chance to tell us what you're really interested in learning about or how we can be helpful out of this body of work. So I'm going to say a few words about Climate Interactive, introduce kind of the overall driving questions behind this research. Then Grace will talk about uh, a few of the specific case studies. I'll share about some of the patterns we saw across the 10 case studies and our goal is to save some time at the end for questions that you might have. Um, so if questions occur to you, you can use the chat to type those in and Stephanie and Shauna will be keeping an eye on that. So I'm gonna turn off my video camera and I hope that you all can see my slides. Use the chat to let folks know if you can't. And as I said, I'm gonna start with a few words about Climate Interactive. If any of you on the webinar know much about Climate Interactive, um, you know that we tend to use tools that help people see what works to address climate change and related issues like energy, water, disaster risk reduction. Um, most of our work has been at the level of global climate change, focused on climate and energy policy. And if you do know our work, you likely have seen um, parts that look like this, which are models about climate change. A lot of our work has been at the level of the UN, helping countries uh, understand the implications of their climate pledges in the UN process, and then also helping journalists and civil society hold countries accountable to the most ambitious climate action possible. And for the first five years or so of Climate Interactive's 10-year uh, life, that was pretty much our core focus, this global focus on climate and energy. Um, since then, we've broadened it a little bit, and, and this slide explains why or our thinking behind that. We were noticing that very often in that world, um, the question of investing in long-term climate protection Action was sort of framed like this. On the one hand, there were these costs that had to be paid now for low carbon investment, for the infrastructure, for new energy systems. And the reward seemed really distant. It was avoided global chain, climate change a long time in the future. And we felt like this wasn't really a complete picture and that we might actually be able to make 
bigger progress on climate if we could focus on a more complete picture, which would look something like this. Those same costs of low carbon investment balanced out not just by the long term global benefit, but also by really local immediate uh, benefit in terms of jobs, health, equity, community cohesion, resilience, food qual quality, air and water quality. Um, and my guess is that if you're on this webinar, you joined probably because you're interested in um, some of those benefits. Maybe you're here because of the long term climate benefit, maybe one of those more short short-term benefits, particularly health. Um, for us, we, we just came to see that focusing on either side of that equation, either the short-term or the long-term, was just an incomplete picture that was making it actually harder to make progress on both. And so our multi-solving uh, program at Climate Interactive is designed to help people have a more complete picture of some of these choices and investments that we face. Another way to think about it is there's one framing of climate change uh, that we call carbon centric that focuses almost entirely on carbon dioxide units you're always measuring are tons of carbon dioxide and you're trying to get those to go down over time. Obviously at Climate Interactive that's a really important part of our mission. Um, in the multi-solving work though we're, we're broadening the focus and drawing a wider circle to include not just the carbon dioxide but all the other things that are going to change and we think be better in a world that has addressed climate change. We invented the word multi-solving. Um, we, we were looking for a word that didn't put any one type of benefit at the center. We, part of the point of multi-solving is uh, we're glad to work with you if climate is your passion, but we're also glad to work with you if health is your passion or economic development is your passion and you're glad to see a climate benefit. So multi-solving just means for us changing lives for the better while protecting the climate. Um, over the years, we've done scans of the key benefits that come along with climate protection. And we developed this one scheme um, to categorize those benefits. There may well be others, but the, the six that we focus on the most uh, are food and water, jobs and assets, health, well being, and safety, connection, by which we mean social connection between people, but also connection between people and nature, um, energy industry, how we make things, mobility, how we get around, and resilience to extreme events, climate events, but other types, types of resilience too, like resilience to economic disruption, for example. So in the report that we launched last week and, and what we're gonna talk about in this webinar, we focus on really one of these pedals, which is the intersection between long-term climate protection and health, well-being, and safety. And you'll see some of these other benefits come into some of the cases, but uh, our, our real focus was the health and climate intersection. And this is a good point to call out the support of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, who both funded this work, but also really served as thinking partners um, in the whole project. So that sets the stage for talking about the report. And before we wanna do that, we'd like to introduce ourselves. Um, you've, you've heard from me so far. So we're just going to work down the list and each team member will just say a little bit about their role in the project. And if uh, everything works right while that's happening, we're also going to ask you to answer a real simple question that, as I said before, will just help us uh, design our future webinars and, and other products that come out of this report. So with that, uh, Grace, do you want to start off and say hello? Grace, I'm not hearing you. Uh, hello, hey. everyone. I hope you can now hear me. I'm Grace based in Nairobi. Uh, in this report, I was involved in the actual research of, of looking for these case studies from around the world. Uh, and we narrowed down from 100 case studies to 10 case studies. And I worked on eight of those case studies. And my colleague, uh, uh, Maria Jose, worked on two of them. And I'll be talking to you about two of them later on today. All right. And I'm Stephanie McCauley. I'm in Greenville, South Carolina. And I coordinated the research, writing, and design of the report. Hmm. 
Good morning, I'm Shauna Edberg and I helped with design and fact-checking. Great, thanks everyone. Um, and so you'll be hearing from these folks, particularly if you find ways to engage with us and um, stay connected with, with the multi-solving project. So before we get into the specifics of the report, there's an important framing point that I wanna make. Um, and we run into this as we talk to people about the intersection of health and climate. Um, looks like I have to answer the poll in order to go on. No, there we go. Um, so this picture is how many people think about health and climate. Um, and it's important. They think about the intersection being uh, the, the, the actions by people sector, sorry, there we go. They talk about uh, if you're a participant in the health sector, what can you do to make a difference on climate? Where does it matter? And they think about the long-term health impacts of uh, climate change. And they say the health sector ought to be working on this along with everyone else. Um, we think that's great and really important. Um, it helps the health sector be ready for the impacts of unavoidable climate change. It brings their voice, their moral imperative to the fight against climate change. In this report, we're thinking about, but we're also thinking about the second part of the system, which is the fact that these actions of investing in the transition to a low carbon economy also have these short term immediate or fairly immediate benefits for health. Um, they, they can, if um, the projects are done with this kind of awareness in mind, lead to improvements in air and water quality, opportunities for physical activity, opportunities for social connection, all of which have a short-term health dividend as well as protecting health in the long-term future. And so when we're talking about health and climate intersections, we're drawing this broad circle around both of these areas. So why does that matter? Uh, a little bit of food for thought about the appeal of thinking about aligning our efforts more in climate and health. If you're coming from the perspective of the health system, a few things to consider. Um, one is the just enormous spending in adaptation and also in recovery. Um, one snapshot, New York City in 2014 spent $2.7 billion on climate change adaptation. Um, not all of those projects are things that will influence health, but a lot of them are. Um, and one of our goals with this report is to have leaders in the health sector start to think of themselves as people who should be showing up for those discussions about how that investment gets made so that it gets made ideally to benefit health and certainly not in things that are gonna be detrimental to health. Um, also think about the anticipated spending that's going to be required um, to meet climate goals in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Think about the new infrastructure, the energy systems, the transportation systems. Um, as more and more clarity emerges about the impact of the built environment on health, it seems pretty obvious um, that these infrastructure decisions about climate are also health decisions. Yet often they're not framed that way. Um, it seems that often there aren't health voices in the room when these discussions about how to meet climate goals um, are being are taking place. So we'll feel really uh, happy about the results of this report if it leads to more participation by the health community in discussions that are about energy and climate change. Uh, if you're coming to this discussion more from the point of view of climate, a few things to consider. Um, as In terms of a percentage of GDP, um, the spending on health in the United States is about twice as large as the spending on climate and energy. And of course, not all of that spending um, is on things that could affect climate, but some of it is. Uh, and so as we're facing this enormous challenge of ambitious climate action, there's allies for us in the health system. Uh, the second just has to do with uh, explaining what we're doing in ways that matter to people. So again and again on surveys of what they're concerned about, health rate, rate, uh, rates much higher for people than long-term climate change. If it was an either or question, you know, you, we're not saying don't talk about climate change, but we're saying if there are places where climate efforts are gonna benefit health, uh, we all need to get better at explaining that in a way that people can understand. Another important reason to tackle these issues together, we believe has to do with equity, um, both in the climate movement and 
for health advocates, equity is emerging as a really important issue. Um, but again, there's very different language used in the two fields. So in climate, uh, many of you probably talk about the idea of a just transition, the idea that as we redesign our cities and our infrastructure for climate, we need to make sure that that um, transition doesn't leave anyone behind and actually benefits people who historically have been marginalized when it comes to investments and infrastructure. Uh, the field of health talks about health equity, this growing body of evidence that um, uh, lack of equity is a determinant of ill health and boosting equity can improve health outcomes. So there's this huge opportunity uh, in the way we address climate to improve equity and by virtue of improving equity to actually improve health. Um, but so far, our observation is that by and large, and of course there are exceptions, but by and large, these, these conversations are happening at different conferences with different sets of professionals. Um, and we think there's a real opportunity for people to join them together into one conversation and one set of efforts. So there are these great reasons um, why, whether we care about climate or we care about health or we care about both, why we ought to try to work together more. Um, um, but that's not the most common pattern at this point. And that's a question that really interested us. Why, why is this a rare approach? And in our report, you can read more about six different obstacles that we identified um, for why there aren't, that why it's just challenging to work on these issues together. Um, you can see more in the report. I'll just quickly go through them. Um, and I bet that many of these are familiar to some of you just from your day-to-day -day work. Uh, the first is just disciplinary silos. Uh, climate and energy and health um, are two different professional paths, obviously. Uh, we found even when it comes to the units that scientists use to measure things, they might measure the same thing using different units. It was very challenging sometimes to get a apples to apples comparison of different scenarios because of the just very different ways of looking at things. Then when it comes to paying for things, a lot of the opportunities we're talking about uh, might be paid for by investments that could be labeled energy or transportation and produce benefits in health. Um, any of you who've worked in, in uh, systems that have budgets know it's really hard when one budget has to pay and another budget gets the benefit and there isn't an overall um, way of looking at the net benefit across the whole system. Um, a lot of the projects that we're gonna talk about required people aligning different jurisdictions, um, you know, either like water and energy or city and county. Um, and each of those interfaces is, uh, it takes effort and relationship and communication. Um, many of these projects really do work best with community engagement at a pretty high level. They impact communities, they work better when people have input and often are even involved in delivering them. Uh, but someone who is trained um, in engineering, climate, energy, health may not necessarily feel they have the skills or feel confident in the skills to do that. Um, a lot of the health benefits that we identified um, aren't necessarily benefits that make sick people better. They often are benefits that prevent future ill health. Um, and while we're not health system experts, our impression um, is that across the US health system, it's harder to prioritize prevention over care, even when that makes sense. And I know there are probably people on this call whose whole, uh, whole work is focused on, on that challenge, but that trickles into this opportunity at the intersection of climate and health. Um, and then while uh, we coming from the climate field see these health benefits as relatively immediate, certainly they don't take centuries, but they also don't take you know, quarters or years, because a lot of them affect the built environment or lifestyle, they sort of slowly accrete to improve health. Um, and yet lots of our decision-making uh, systems are uh, on a much shorter time horizon than that. So given those obstacles, um, we're really interested in the fact that despite them, there is some multi-solving happening around the world. And the approach we took in this project was to identify those bright spots and ask what can we learn about how people have gotten around these obstacles and how can we build that capacity um, so that there can be more of this um, you know, very beneficial approach. So uh, I won't go a lot into our methodology, but uh, 
the team conducted a, a global scan of um, both the peer reviewed literature and more journalistic literature and using our different networks. And they identified 106 different examples that met some criteria, for, particularly for aligning action between the climate and health sectors. Um, it was really interesting to me that we found examples pretty much everywhere we looked. Um, so the scales where we found them ranged from individual departments within hospitals, um, all the way through cities, neighborhoods, countries, um, and even some regional projects. Uh, every sector where we looked, energy, transportation and urban design, climate adaptation, ecosystems, nature-based solutions, healthcare, food and water, um, and on every continent where we looked. Uh, one thing you'll notice if you dig into our report, there aren't any case studies from the US. Um, that was part of the design of the study. The uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation was really focused on bringing knowledge from around the world to the US. So this doesn't mean we don't think multi-solving for climate and health is happening in the US, just our study wasn't designed to pick that up. Um, our study also wasn't designed to really uh, compare the, the frequency of multi-solving, so don't interpret too much about the, the shape of the wedges on these charts. The real message that we want to share is everywhere we looked, we found examples of multi-solving. Um, we took those hundred and one of the most important criteria was we were looking for deliberate multi-solving, not just that there happened to be benefits to climate and health, but that people were working together somehow either uh, using budgets from health and climate or knowledge from health and climate um, to get their project done. Uh, we wanted the projects to be far enough along that the health and climate evident uh, outcomes were evident. Uh, it was important that we be able to talk to people who'd been involved in the projects, so that was a criteria. Um, because our audience was in the US, we were looking for examples we thought would resonate here. Um, so some good examples of multi-solvent for climate and health are neglected. One example would be, um, say, clean cook stoves, which are, are clearly beneficial for both of those goals, uh, um, but we weren't sure would bring a lot of meaning to a US audience. And then we were aiming for a diversity of scales and geographies. So these are the 10 cases that we came up with, and um, Grace is going to uh, tell us a little bit about them. Uh, Thank you, Beth, and I hope now you can hear me clearly. Please do let me know if you can't hear me. Um, as you can see, we settled down on these 10 case studies, and they're really from different parts of the world, uh, Japan, Colombia, Malaysia, Australia. They cut across uh, the transport sector, buildings, food, energy, and waste. And what you have on to the far uh, right, as just a, a brief description of what these case studies uh, are all about. Today I'm going to talk about two of the case studies, uh, the Warm Up New Zealand, which is about home insulation in New Zealand, a countrywide project, and then Operation TLC, which was in only six hospitals in the UK. Uh, Beth, if you could show me the next uh, one of the case studies, I'll be able to to demonstrate how these case studies have been structured in the report that you perhaps have read so far. Can you see that, Grace? Yes, I can see that, yeah. Um, and if you can share with me the, the, um, the, the mouse, yeah, that would also be helpful, yeah. That's, all right, I'll try that. So, okay. What you see to the, to the far left here, you see Operation TLC and the some days and figures there. We tried as much as possible to bring in case studies which are, or projects which had been completed or were, were being completed rather than projects which are still in at design stage. And so we have the timeline indicated there and then the partners who are involved in the location of these projects. Then we have different icons to the far uh, right. As you can see, there's an icon of England, which shows you where specifically this project was taking place. Then whether this was a, as, a, as a business, a government, or a community. Then the next icon is really the, the sector in which this is falling and what other issues are being tackled. So we have a building, 
and we have uh, energy as the last icon. And we, we keep on using these icons in all the case studies. And in the, in the second page, we also make use of these case studies. We then uh, had, because there was a lot of information available for the 10 case studies that we settled on. So we had to look for a way to package this that it's, it's well, it, it can be read by policymakers within a very short time. So the first paragraph tries as much as possible to mention what the issue was and what the, the actors involved did. And we, can, we also highlighted the, the, the project goals, as you see. We also went on and talked about overcoming obstacles because we thought that was the most important thing. We are talking about people working uh, beyond their silos. We need to talk about how they overcame obstacles of working together or even solving the, the problem at hand. Remember what uh, Beth has mentioned, that they intentionally chose to work on health and climate goals at the same time. So obviously there are obstacles to, to overcome. And we took the data that was coming from some of their reports and we were able to come up with some of these uh, visuals that you, you can see. Um, and then uh, moving on to the, to, the, to the next page, the second page of the case study, we highlight uh, the different roles and responsibilities of the different actors who are involved, and that's at the leadership and collaboration. And there you're able to see what did the academia do, what did the business people do, what did the healthcare community do in this particular project? Were there volunteers involved? Were there uh, private sector or social mission involved? What specific role did they play in this project? So we were able to bring this because our intention is to show how there was, a, there was an issue and then different actors worked together and were able to bring these others on board to work on this particular issue and this is how they work. Uh, and also we looked at the replication. This I felt was very important because if, if we are talking about not solving being, the way we need to think uh, beyond just uh, carbon emissions, we need to think about not solving. We need, to, we need to show that actually these projects have either been replicated elsewhere or specific components of these projects have been picked up and they're being used elsewhere. So we, we look and we ask them questions about replication, whether there are plans to do that or whether it was actually happening. What is important to note is that for each of these 10 case studies, we are in touch with the institutions that are mentioned at the, at the bottom of these case studies. And we talked to them over phone, we emailed and they sent us materials to read. And that's why we were able to develop these case studies. And finally, as you can see, there are other icons down there on the benefits. And here we have separated the climate benefits and the health benefits, and we have specific figures on what each of these means. And finally, we bring back the flower, as Beth has, uh, has explained about each of these petals. Even though we were just focusing on the health and climate connection, we are able to show how each of these case studies, what, what are the other multiple benefits that imagine for this one, for example, you can see there are those there are jobs and assets uh, as of one of the achievements health and well-being as well as connection as well as energy and mobility uh, so we're going to move on and i'm going to discuss two of the case studies and this will be one of the case studies beth if you could move back to the slides Thank you. Uh, so I'll discuss two of the case studies because I hope you'll have a chance to read all these case studies. Uh, I'm not saying these are these are the best case studies. I just decided to pick two of those which I feel bring out interesting issues that we could have a discussion around during this webinar. Operation TLC is a project that was carried out between 2013 and 2015 in the UK by Bugs Health NHS Trust. It's part of the larger national health system in the UK and had five plus one, six hospitals in East London. And the way this project started is that the environmental manager then at, at Bugs Health thought of a project how she could reduce energy costs at these institutions while at the same time addressing other issues to do with um, to do with uh, carbon emissions in line with the NHS targets for that particular period. And she was able to bring together a charity, which is the Global Action Plan, and different companies which were already engaging with the, with the hospitals uh, uh, through the normal general procurement process. And they discussed about how they could do this. Is it possible to improve on the equipment so that we improve on energy efficiency? Is it possible to improve on the, on the buildings just so that we 
we improve on our energy use, and that would help us cut on energy cost. And, and, and what they came up with was Operation TLC, where basically TLC uh, means uh, turning off equipment when it's not in use, switching off lights, and closing doors. And this was actually an awareness campaign where the staff were taken through a training where they were they were, they, were, they were sort of shown what kind of equipment could we switch off when you're not using. We need to actually work on this equipment to ensure that it's easy to switch on and off and not in use, or do we need to actually automate these equipment? There was also motivation, sort of awarding the best words to, to turn off equipment, to close doors, or even to switch off the lights. Uh, when they started this project, they did not, they did not anticipate that that this project would have benefits on them as staff, but also on the patients, by the fact that they were closing doors and they were switching off lights and they also sort of increased the amount of natural light going into the patients' rooms, they actually observed that the patients were, were actually responding very positively. Uh, they were having fewer sleep disruptions because the doors were closed. Uh, there were also so less private, uh, privacy uh, disruptions, but also the 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 patient request actually reduced by 38 percent that is patients stopped asking for for room change for example because then they thought it was much more comfortable being the space where they were on the other hand in as much as they were reducing on energy they were reducing on their emissions the staff themselves were also benefiting by the fact they had fewer requests from their patients so they also had more time to actually uh relax and that was also helping on the quality of work and their productivity as as staff. The things that they highlight in this uh, in this case study, which are very important, is the aspect of working together, the aspect of research. They had to do research, you know, are we actually making any, uh, achieving any benefits by doing this? So they, they, invest, uh, they invited a couple of universities to come and do research on this particular work. And just bringing in a uh, global action plan, which is sort of a charity which works in the UK to work with these hospitals, sort of infusing new ideas into their way of working and bringing in companies which are already working with them. And this project ended up being supported by N uh, the Bats Health and NHS Trust, as well as these companies. Uh, if we move to the next slide, uh, we can see some of the lessons that we can learn from this case study. Uh, and, and the most important for me was how the, the trust was able to share the vision with the actors whom they expected to participate. They came up with the idea that we'd like to, to reduce on energy cost, reduce our emissions, but still ensure we deliver the same patient experience. Uh, sharing this vision with the different actors, with the different departments at the hospital, and being able to convince them that it was a worthy cause. That way, they were able to attract funding from the within that the same companies, uh, uh, GE and Science Cancer, uh, they were the same ones who, who provided funding for implementing this project. But even though this project has not progressed afterwards, there are lessons to be learned in, in that aspect of sharing the vision. Uh, and being able to communicate that from the start of the project to the end of the project, when I interviewed the uh, the partners from Global Action Plan and also from Bats Health. One of the issues they, they highlighted was the, the aspect of constant communication, what was happening, where they were having obstacles and how they would overcome these obstacles at every stage. Uh, but also involving them in measuring the impacts. What would the company be interested to measure in such a, in such a project to see if they are gaining or not? What would be, what, what, what would they, uh, would they staff be interested in, what are the patients interested in, and then they were able to measure those aspects of this project. Uh, I think this particular project, uh, when you think of the multiple benefits arising from it, is one of them was on jobs and assets, and that these companies continued working at this hospital. This was the issue of health and well-being, both of the patients and also of the staff. But also the connections that are, that are made in this uh, in this particular case that is very important for us to note. And as you can see from the icons down there, we have the issues of improving buildings for efficiency, issues of uh, business, ensuring that business uh, the businesses are not at a loss, but also energy efficiency, reducing noise in hospitals, which is still a very important aspect in hospitals. But most importantly, also conserving energy. And overall, this project actually helped 
uh, in, in, the, in the overall commitment of the NHS trust in reducing emissions as part of the UK's uh, strategy to, to reduce emissions as a country. Uh, if we move on to the next case study, which is all the way from New Zealand, um, this particular case study is very interesting. When I talk to them, to the people at the energy, and energy Efficiency and Conservation Authority, when I ask them about the history of this case study, they, they mentioned how it all started at, at, at just after the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. And they were thinking through how they were going to deal with that issue, but there were multiple issues around that time. Issues of employment, issues of energy, but also issues of respiratory health, and many more people are dying as a result of respiratory diseases. So the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Authority positioned themselves with, uh, as, as a department, as a, as a unit within the government on how they could address the issue of energy efficiency while addressing other issues that are actually connected with, it, with their main issue. That was, how could we enhance energy efficiency while reducing uh, death from respiratory diseases, while at the same time also creating jobs? And that's exactly what they started doing in 2009. A small project last in 2009 to 2013, that time it was called Warm Up New Zealand, Smart Homes, specifically targeting houses built before 2000, and also for people from lower economic backgrounds, and specifically the aim at providing grants and financing up to 60% for home insulation to the landlords and also to, to the homeowners, to, to the, yeah, the largest and to the homeowners. And after this first phase, which was specifically targeted and insulating to ensure there was energy efficiency, they engaged several universities and several institutions of, of the government to conduct research on the impact of this small project with a very small budget in relation to overall government budget. And they realized that they, they had even more health, but a higher sort of health, uh, health benefit than even the energy benefit. And that led to the second phase of the Warm Up New Zealand program, which now was for health folks, starting 2013 2016, again insulating more homes. Again, targeting those built before 2000 and those from low economic backgrounds. But they also started partnering with the Ministry of Health so that those specific individuals who were about to be suffering from respiratory diseases related to homes that were not home could be referred to, to this program. And this program was actually all over the country. Now, this program from 2016 has been extended to 2019, so it's still progressing. As a result, by the time we were conducting this research, we had uh, over 300,000 homes already insulated. That's about 20% of all homes in New Zealand. And again, we are receiving 60% financing. What I need to mention, which is very important about this case study, is how a, a government institution was able to, to collaborate with other financiers. So the money was also coming from the county government it was also coming from the private sector it was also coming from other 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 sort of uh, philanthropies to provide funding the other important component is that it's not the authority which was going and insulating the home they subcontracted insulation companies and so during this period from 2009 up to now small insulation companies in each part of new zealand came up and they would get these subsidies from the government to then go and insulate these homes. In that way, then they were able to create these jobs in the sort of in the cost building and the construction and home insulation. That's where they were creating the jobs. And then the families of the homes were getting the insulation. And at the same time, they were able to attract this, um, this other financial into this project. So that's, that's, those are the connections that this project was able to bring. In terms of overcoming obstacles for this, particular project. Of course, part of part of the support provided was a grant, but also there's a component where the homeowners uh, or the land was needed to pay for the insulation. The government was providing up to 60 percent for some of this uh, uh, for, for some of this insulation. However, they also uh, covered that with simple repayment option, which then enabled the, those benefiting from this program to actually really engage, yeah, and then uh, really uh, benefit from this program. The other important component was the awareness creation. And I recall when we, we had uh, one of the discussions, 
how the emphasis that the government specifically invested finances in creating awareness on why they were investing in Roma New Zealand. It was for health, uh, health benefits, it was for energy benefits, and, and in that way they were able to attract people to actually seek out uh, to, to insulate their homes. Another benefit, uh, or rather another obstacle which has been overcome, which is rather a bigger challenge is that the reason why most of some of the homes were not insulated is because there wasn't really a policy put in place by that time. And so from 2019 onwards, a policy has been put in place in New Zealand on how homes should be insulated. And this has been informed by this project and what has been happening during this period. So we could say that's some of, one of the benefits for this particular project. Uh, and now to the last slide about the lessons that we have learned from this particular case. That is that governments too can work beyond their silos. For you see, here's a case of a government identifying a challenge and then position itself, even, even though they are energy, it's an energy sector, they can address employment and health, but still be able to account for that. And that was only possible because they had sort of a much solving mindset from the, from, from the onset of this particular project. Um, another lesson is about the scaling up. You see, scaling up doesn't have to mean we do a grand project all over. What we see in Warm Up New Zealand is they took they took small steps at every stage. A small project in 2009 learned from that by actually conducting proper research and that. And why but to expand that 20, 2009, I mean 2013 to 2016, and now have extended that 2016 to 2019. So scaling up doesn't always has to be this grand scale where you then cover the rest of the cut and offer everyone the service, but could actually be taking smaller steps and expanding little by little given the budget that you have, given the partners that you're able to bring on board, but also the lessons that you are learning and where you need to, to, to focus most. Those are some of the benefits uh, of really looking at, into these case studies. And again, going back to the flower, this project had other multiple benefits, as I have mentioned, jobs, health and well-being, the connections that were made, but also on energy efficiency, reducing emissions, but as also resilience. Um, I think I want to have the work back there, and we can have questions later on that. Beth. Thanks, Grace. Um, yeah, and Grace will be here at the end of the webinar, so if you have questions about either case, uh, just let us know. I, I'm going to just share a few thoughts about patterns that we observed across the 10 different case studies, and then we'll wrap up with some time for discussion and questions. One of the first things that we noticed uh, talking to people involved in these projects is that um, they didn't necessarily feel like they were part of a movement or a community of practice. Um, they were very focused on the project they were doing, and I think it's understandable, you know, if you look across these case studies that had to do with food and mobility and hospitals, um, people might not easily see that they're in some way all doing the same thing, just in very different contexts. Um, Grace has mentioned this a little bit. Um, not all the case studies we looked at uh, were people able to measure in financial terms their benefits relative to their costs, but many of them did, and many of the ones that did had benefits that at least um, covered and sometimes exceeded the costs, sometimes exceeded the cost by a factor of um, threefold, one example was sevenfold. Um, one thing we noticed though was that there really wasn't a standardized approach to measuring these benefits. Um, uh, and a whole different levels of sort of skill and sophistication in, in measuring them. Um, we also really couldn't see any one size fits all, um, any standardized approach. These projects were very um, opportunistic in, in a good way in that they were very sensitive to their context. Um, the benefits that people cared about were what drove the projects often, and they were very path dependent and relationship dependent. Um, that said, even though they were very idiosyncratic and different, we saw six things that seemed common across the projects. One of them was um, a champion or sometimes champions, uh, a person or a few people 
who had a vision and uh, persistence and um, some ability to inspire others. Most of them were designed in some way to incorporate learning and growth over time. They, they never started full blown. They were often small seeds that expanded uh, both who was involved and what they were trying to do. Um, Grace mentioned this, I think, in both of these case studies, part of what enabled them to be so successful is that they were measuring their uh, benefits and including benefits that maybe weren't the, the primary benefit that the project started with. You might have caught that when Grace was talking about Operation TLC. Uh, it was really motivated by um, saving energy, but they didn't just measure energy. They also measured patient benefits, and that helped the project gain traction. Most of these uh, projects were pretty clever about um, uh, the fact that even desirable changes are change, and there's a human tendency to resist that. Many of the projects involved in one way or another the, the uh, people who would be impacted by them in either the design or the implementation. One example, a project in the UK focused on walking to school used the children who would walk along those routes to help create the audits that designed the routes. Uh, community engagement um, is, is connected to that, strategies to, to counter resistance to change. Uh, all the projects that we looked at really invested in communication and um, not just in one direction. So community engagement might mean you, your partners in other departments, it might mean the people or communities impacted by the project. And these weren't an afterthought, but they were designed into the projects. Um, and the projects either had a strong financing plan or uh, many of them were actually pretty low cost. Uh, lots of them were changes in behavior or in connecting different parts of a system together in a more effective way rather than some very expensive capital investment. From those observations, we have a short list of things that we would offer if you're trying to bring more multi-solving into your own work. Um, probably the most important is to think about starting small and starting where you are. We, uh, this was a surprise for me that the projects didn't um, first assemble this very complex network of stakeholders across all the possible benefits. They maybe started with a couple of them and organically expanded their network. Um, so related to that is as you're starting small, uh, invest whatever you can in measuring the benefits that you're creating. Um, quantitatively, if you can, qualitatively, um, if you can't, if you don't have the ability to, to um, do it quantitatively. And then build your communications efforts around those co-benefits. Um, be exper experimentative. Um, many of the projects tried, you know, multiple different ways of a accomplishing what they wanted to do and used evaluation to figure out what worked best. We've talked about investing in communications, not as an afterthought, um, but really relentlessly sharing what you're doing and why. Um, think about the longevity of the project. Many of them, although they started in a small idiosyncratic way, were around and producing benefits for us to observe and you know, include in the project because they'd somehow embedded those early seeds into something more standardized, either the standard operating procedures of an institution or in laws and regulations. Um, many of them found ways to create sustainable financial flows. Um, one example was a project that was focused on um, removing um, usable food from the waste stream and getting it to people who needed it. And they started a part of that project that um, where they would make jams and preserves and so out of a, a fraction of the waste food and sold those products as a way to sustain their other activities. Um, and related to all of these is uh, expect that the project will grow and scale up even if you don't know exactly where and how it will. Um, so think about what to put in place um, that will be adaptive uh, via that process of scale up, but will keep your original vision um, somehow strong and embedded uh, as the project grows and develops. We also have people, um, you know, particularly from a funding or policy community asking 
what they can do to make multi-solving projects um, you know, more doable. What can we change in the environment to encourage more of this? Um, the first one, our recommendation comes out of that observation that, that there doesn't seem to be a place where multi-solvers can gather and learn from each other. Uh, we think it would be incredible for someone to um, uh, decide to try and fund and develop that. We think that uh, you know, people setting up a, a walk to school program in the UK have something to teach people who are working on hospital energy efficiency in Thailand, but in the normal course of things, they're not gonna meet each other and learn from each other. Um, replication is clearly what we're focused on. We wanna see more of these projects. And we think it will be great if you know the things worked out in one place can really inspire someone to, to copy a lot of what, what has been worked out in another place. But because of our observation about how site-specific path-dependent these projects are, we suspect that the thing that's really replicable is the approach of working together, starting small, measuring, investing in communication. Um, and we think that maybe is what should be encouraged as much as, cool, look at this great project that insulated homes, we should do that here. Um, we think particularly funders uh, can contribute by supporting small seeds. None of the projects that we looked at uh, just happened as a full-blown cross-sectoral communication. They often, uh, uh, collaboration, they often started as very small seeds. Um, I've talked about how important it was for people to measure their co-benefits, but this is a whole skill set. Um, you all in the health world, uh, you know, bring the tool of health impact assessment, which could be a part of this, but many, many other people don't know how to use that tool. Um, and sometimes you don't know even what the exact co-benefits are going to be. It's part of this attitude of being very open and watching what are the results of your action and then figuring out how to measure them. So we think funders and policymakers could help um, producing protocols and financial support or um, technical assistance to do that kind of measurement. Um, and to expect a certain kind of patience um, that allows for experimentation, which also means failures, evolution over time, um, we say that these projects seem to develop at the speed of trust and there's just no substitute for the just investment of time and communication it takes to build that. Um, so this last slide is to remind me to tell you of all the other ways you can engage with what we're um, doing and offering. And I believe we're gonna be able to both post these slides on our website and, and send you a link in an email so you can get all of this information then but know that there's um, there's many ways we're trying to share this information in bite-sized pieces um, including uh, our next webinar which will be April 18th um, led by our colleague Maria Jose who we mentioned um, and particularly any of you who have Spanish speaking um, colleagues who might be interested that webinar will be in Spanish and we'll send out more information about that um, so thanks very much for your attention and it looks like we have a few minutes. I'm just, it's 9.52. Um, if there are any questions, maybe Stephanie and Shauna can help us work through those. And thanks again. So I'm not hearing anyone. Um, Stephanie or Shauna, are you guys trying to read out questions? And Grace, we had one last uh, poll for the group. Yeah, so you could you could ask um, people to try that out. It may be that we don't have any questions. I'm not sure. Um, one question is, will this re be recorded and accessible? And we are recording the webinar, so we'll make that available to everybody. Um, that's the only question we have so far. Okay.
Well, we'll just um, wait patiently for a minute or so just to make sure there aren't any questions. Otherwise, we can um, close and thank you all again for your attention. All right, well, we were thrilled to share um, to share this work. And as I said at the beginning, but I'll just reiterate, um, now that the report is finished, our goal is to just make it as useful to people as possible. So please be in touch, um, you know, both if you have ideas about where we might share this information, also if you have suggestions on how to make it more compelling um, or any critical feedback, that's all useful to us too in the goal of just making this as useful as possible. So thanks very much and hope everyone has a great day.